the project we have now, I'll just kind of jump ahead to this project. It's funded by um, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Um, I think you've heard from other speakers affiliated or funded by that, um, by the same grant mechanism. Um, Elise is actually who, you, who you've uh, seen as my grant manager, my program manager. Um, so there, the state inadvertently collected more uh, revenue than they should have to manage their med uh, medical card program. And they just needed enough to run it and they had too much, so they got permission from the state legislature to give it out in research grants. So there's been a series of, I think, maybe three now um, calls for, for research proposals. So they're kind of one-offs. It's not, the state is not a, you know, a funder of research. Um, <laughs> typically, but they've had these one-off calls for proposals. So we were funded, um, my co-PI, who's uh, Dr. Michael Kosnett, a toxicologist, we were funded um, by a call that was for public health um, research. The other calls have been more medically focused and therapeutic focused. The problem that we noticed, that others have noticed, is that it's very difficult to determine if someone is impaired from cannabis at roadside. And there's, there's a lot of reasons why. Um, and the, the, really, the fundamental problem is that, sorry, our state has a five nanogram uh, legal limit of THC in whole blood per milliliter of whole blood. And that um, probably sounded good and felt good um, at the time that that was incorporated into the law, but there's very little empirical evidence that that makes sense. And the reason it doesn't make sense has to do with how THC is metabolized. So have, have some of your other speakers talked about this a little bit, or maybe it's not relevant for the other work. But so the issue is, um, as you consume, uh, THC rises very rapidly in the blood, probably peaks within about the first half an hour, and then drops very rapidly as it moves into the brain and exits the bloodstream. As the, the THC level is falling in the blood very rapidly, the curve looks like a waterfall, they call it, and at the same time, the sensation of being high and the impairing effects are rising, right? So impairing effects are going up as blood levels are going down. That is the opposite of, let's say, alcohol, where the blood level rise, the impairing effects, you know, you get drunker as your blood level goes up. So I think the public, in our familiarity with alcohol, wants THC to be metabolized like alcohol, ethanol, and it's not. It's actually kind of opposite. So there's a fancy word in, um, uh, for in, in toxicology and pharmacokinetics for this called counterhysteresis. So it's a counterclockwise metabolism. So um, that means that blood is not a great marker, right? Um, so you could, so asking someone if they're high is probably a better marker than, than measuring their blood. And then the other issue we have, we have some individual differences in metabolism for sure. Um, we have differences in like edibles and smoked products in terms of how long the effects last and, and um, the metabolism. And then the biggest issue we have is this issue of tolerance. So that this frequent um, heavy use uh, leads clearly to some tolerance to some effects, but we don't know exactly which effects and, how, and um, if that tolerance rises to the level that people may be safer or safe as some, some other driver that we're okay with being on the road. So that's a huge unknown. So what we are left with, um, so a daily, a daily user, uses every day all, day, all day long, may wake up in the morning after not using and be sober and have a blood level that's over the legal limit. This is clearly documented. And then you can have an occasional user, um, who, you know, who uses some, becomes very impaired because they have no tolerance, and they're below the legal limit by the time they're pulled over, because of metabolism being so fast. So you have a state law that potentially over-identifies daily users as impaired when they're not and under-identifies uh, occasional users as not impaired when they are. Get it? So for the policy people in here, it's not great. <laughs> not a great policy. So, and I think, I think where this comes from is this sense that we, we really like for alcohol, we have this 0.08 limit or 0.05, you blow, you know, we're really, we like this objective biomarker of impairment. And we want that, and it doesn't exist, it may never exist for cannabis. So what do we do about that? So some people are looking into saliva tests, oral fluid tests. In my mind, those are still plagued by the same problem as blood, is they're not gonna mark impairment, they're gonna mark 
recent use. That might be great for some applications. There's states with zero tolerance laws. There's entire countries with zero tolerance laws. Whether that's right or wrong, that is the law. And so a device that tells you if you used in the last hour, that's going to meet the bill for those policy needs. Or a workplace setting that's zero tolerance, that you're just not allowed to use. They don't care. Even if it's on the weekend, your own time, they don't want you to use. That's their prerogative. Um, a device that can test if you've used recently is going to be um, great for that application. But it's not going to work for the roadside where we don't care so much about when you use. We care if you're impaired. That's the statute. Are you unsafe to drive? So, um, so that's, I mean, there, these news articles come out all the time about oral fluid saliva. My philosophy is that's not going to have the solution to our problem in Colorado. Um, so I think really the issue that we need to look at is something that can detect if you're impaired or not. And then that, that assessment is objectively linked to some empirical data about driving behavior. So that's kind of the path we're on. We're not going to answer it in this research study, but that's kind of the philosophy that we're pursuing here. So we have a driving simulator. That's kind of meant to be the gold standard. Um, really, the gold standard would be how people drive in the real world, but you know, baby steps and let's triangulate from diff different data sources. So that's our gold standard. And then we have two devices that are meant to measure impairment. One is an iPad that has um, what are called psychomotor tests, reaction time, memory, judgment, spatial um, function. So we'll, we'll look at that. So the idea is if you could give someone that at roadside and they fail that test, whatever the algorithm says, and that's marked to real driving behavior, then that's an objective measure of impairment. It doesn't matter how much you used. Um, like it, take, it would take into account tolerance, and that could work. Um, so a lot of companies are pursuing that avenue. And the other device we're testing here is an ocular device. It's virtual reality goggles that you look into, and it's measuring a lot of things about eye movement. And that's really analogous to what police officers do, but it's going to do it in an objective way. Because so police officers are doing, they're looking for eye nystagmus with alcohol, where your eye um, bounces when you get to the periphery if you're, if you're drunk. Um, smooth pursuit, the ability to follow the police officer's fingers. Lack of convergence, the inability to cross your eyes. Um, and I may be forgetting something. And then pupil signs. What's that? There's a bunch of eye signs. Yeah, so the secret to the soul is in the eyes, right? So it turns out the eyes, based on the drug you're using, this works for a lot of drug categories, the eyes act differently. And so the, the maker of this device is saying, maybe we can measure these things and then we can detect impairment. But it could be ultimately from a lot of different drug categories. But we're focused on cannabis. So that's another kind of line of research. And then some people are pursuing um, like brain waves, EEG stuff. So that's kind of what's out there now. So the chase is for an objective biological marker that's linked to impairment, not just recent use. So that's kind of the, the research hypothesis and question um, in a lot of words. So what, we, what we are, we're, we're doing is recruiting um, 90 people. We're almost done. We hope to be done at the end of June. We've had, um, we've had about 70 complete participants. And we're recruiting 30 daily users, 30 occasional users, and 30 non-users. So the 30 daily and occasional users, that's to look at this issue of tolerance, to be able to understand across, across a wide range of pattern of use, which, by the way, most of the research out there is, is uh, especially in this world, is limited to uh, very occasional users. There's very little research on daily users for driving. So th that's why this issue of tolerance is actually um, not very well understood. And then the non-users, this is not an experiment, so we're not going to have them smoke, and we're not directly comparing them. We're trying to understand learning effects. So anytime you give someone an assessment multiple times in a row, even a survey or any kind of test, the SATs, they get better at it naturally. That's a it's called a testing effect. It's, um, it's a problem in research study design. And so we want to understand how much better you get at the simulator normally, how much better you get at the iPad. So we can kind of understand if someone, if a, if a daily user stays flat from pre to post smoking, what would a non-user do? Would they get a little better? Would they also stay flat? Would they get way better? Because if they get way better, then flat is kind of not great, right? And then we, so the, the idea or our hypothesis is that a non-user is probably going to get a little better over time. They get used, they get familiar with these things. A daily user might get a little better, might stay the same, might get a little worse, and then we think occasional users should get a lot worse, hopefully, if they use enough. 
So, um, so they come in, they do these three assessments, they get their blood drawn. Then um, if you're in the smoking categories, you're invited to smoke up to 15 minutes, the amount you normally use for the desired effect you normally want. So it's observational, it's not an experiment. Um, they bring their own flower product. Um, and it, so we'll look at our smoke room. And then after that, they do all the assessments again. So we compare post to pre or, you know, time two to time one within person to look at your own individual change. So some people may be better or worse drivers starting out. That's fine. How much better or worse do you get? When we got funded, what we had proposed to do was park a van, an RV near campus on a public road and have people smoke in the van and cross the street and come to a lab on campus. It's a great idea. It's great. Um, at the time that we wrote the proposal, uh, if I think back, everyone thought Hillary Clinton would be president. By the time we got the money and submitted our IRB, Jeff Sessions was the attorney general. And our campus is, turns out these IRB decisions and these um, legal decisions, they're not like always black and white. They take into account risk. They're risk assessors, right? And at the time they felt like our protocol was absolutely too much risk. We have a lot of physicians on campus. If it looks at all like we're prescribing um, cannabis and dosing, that's absolutely illegal federally. All our all the funding on campus is threatened, all those doctors' licenses are threatened, and our study is just not worth it to campus to do that, right? We're small potatoes compared to all that research going on. So they, they said absolutely not, and kind of left us high, and I, I felt like a little bit high and dry. We had to find our own solution. So um, one of the ideas that would have been workable is if we could have driven to someone's house and they can use in their own residence, but our simulator's not mobile. Up in Boulder, they do research, they have a canavan, they are mobile, right? So, so we thought about, do we just ditch the simulator and be, do some computer thing, or, you know? Um, uh, the other thing, well, that, that, that was pretty much, oh, the other thing we could have done is brought people here, have them do the assessments, drive them home to smoke, and drive them back. We didn't feel like we wanted to spend that much time. <laughs> the, the, their, their subjective high would probably go down, it'd be, make recruitment very challenging. Um, so that seemed unworkable. So really what we wanted to do was, was find a house. It was very hard. We went through um, a lot of commercial landlords who just felt they, weren't, they didn't have a problem with what we were doing. They, didn't, they were pretty sure we weren't going to be a nuisance. But for the amount of square footage we wanted, they just kind of felt like we weren't worth the trouble. Um, and we even tried, we talked to some industry partners. They were very willing to host us, but it actually wasn't legal for them to allow smoking where you're gr growing or, do, or selling, right? Um, and we also considered the social, there's like now social clubs that might have been workable because those are places where you're allowed to smoke. Uh, but they weren't, I don't know if they're up, is there one or two there's up two and running? Yeah. So they weren't. And, and we also weren't sure if it was good for our um, perception of conflict of interest to really be co-located mm -hmm. with the cannabis industry. We want to stay neutral in this um, kind of debate between uh, the cannabis community and the law enforcement community. We want them both to like us and think that our research is important because, or, or both to hate us equally. Either way is fine, so long as it's balanced. So it's very challenging and it continues to be very difficult to do experimental research on cannabis in this country because you, if you want to know the dose you're giving someone, which is what you need for an experiment to control that, you have to use uh, federally procured marijuana, which is only sold by the University of Mississippi, it's low quality, it's low potency, low or low concentration. So we're willing to take the trade-offs of not knowing exactly how much people use, but it's realistic. So that's kind of where we are. New for you, 10 o'clock tonight, whether or not you supported legalization, Everybody's on the same side here when it comes to keeping our roads safe. What we're still trying to figure out is what impact pot really has on driving. Well, Denver 7's Jacqueline Allen found a group of researchers paying people to get high to find out. That's right, especially people who may have built up a tolerance to mar marijuana, medical users. Some research has shown that it does not have the same effect on them. So now Colorado is a test grounds to figure out the best way to stop impaired driving without locking up people who aren't. I feel like I'm a safe driver. Basically, every day he gets behind the wheel. I've had one ticket in the past 10 years, and I've never had an accident. Tyler Proc has been using cannabis. Well, I mean, I've used it almost every day for the past seven years. 
This medical marijuana patient says Colorado's THC limits aren't fair and don't work to keep our roads safe. It's not fair for the medicinal patients uh, because cannabis stays in your system for 30 days. Now in a brick house in Aurora, All right, you ready? that argument is being put to a scientific test. The goal is to better understand impaired driving so that we can prevent impaired driving. Researchers with the CU Anschutz School of Public Health are asking for people to get high in this room and then drive in this simulator. Testing people who use pot every day, people who use once or twice a week, and people who don't use it all. We know that certain drugs really deteriorate people's performance behind the wheel. Alcohol's a classic example for that. Our understanding of how cannabis affects driving is less well developed. You can see the green dot. Mm -hmm. Other tests look at eye movement in virtual reality goggles and hand-eye coordination and decision-making on an iPad. Yeah. How did I do? I think you did okay. Really? Yeah. The goal is to find out if tools like these could enhance field sobriety tests for police or employers. So this is one more tool they could bring to the roadside to understand uh, impairment. Tyler says he'd put his driving up against anyone on prescription drugs or drinking and says not only is he safe after smoking. Safer than if not. Why is that? Um, because if not, uh, back pain's tough. I mean, it can be as distracting as anything else. Now, they are recruiting volunteers for this study who, yes, get paid to get high if they meet the criteria. But you have to bring your own marijuana, and none is kept there. We've put all the information on the DenverChannel.com. And it is important to say that they require people to arrange for their rides after the study so sure. that no one gets high and drives. But you're sense. right. There's so many unknowns with marijuana, opioids. Absolutely. So many things. Especially with tolerance. Yeah. This is Good a point. New frontier. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jack. Thanks, Jack. One thing that keeps me up at night is that like our results are going to be boring. <laughs> we haven't looked at them. That's very scary to spend this much money and this much time. The other thing that I worry about, um, quite honestly, is um, our staff safety and our equipment safety. So <laughs> And just kind of the, the practical realities of like, these are, these are real people, this is like real money. Um, and yeah, so we do not have a good handle on if it's going up or down because um, it's, it's the number, what we have is like number of arrests, number of DUIs, number of crashes. Um, but that's, it's influenced, certainly the number of DUIs and arrests and, and testing is very influenced by how many police officers are working the police um, municipality, or the, sorry, the city or the county has to pay for tests. So if you do a full drug panel, that costs a lot of money. So there's a strong disincentive to not test for drugs if someone has used alcohol, because you can get them on the alcohol charge. So if someone has co-used alcohol and cannabis, which is very, a very common, um, co-use of alcohol in, in a drug is a very common um, profile of it as someone pulled over for a DUI. Why bother? It's expensive. It's technically complicated. It's hard to defend in court because there's all these, you know, defenses you can make against cannabis. Just do with the alcohol charge. So um, there's a lot of confounders in the data. Fatal crash data is probably a little better indicator, but in our country and in our state, we we um, only track if um, THC was present, yes or no, and that includes inactive metabolites. So. It might mean the person who was involved in a fatal crash had used a week ago or 30 days ago. That is not a contributing factor to that crash. We can't disentangle that. So our surveillance data in this country for fatal crashes related to cannabis use is really terrible. Um, so I, I mean, what I would point to, it, so it, uh, CDOT, the Department of Transportation, when they release numbers, it appears that the number of crashes where they test someone for cannabis and they are cannabis positive, that does appear to be going up, but like I said, so is population, so is number of drivers, so is number of miles traveled, maybe so is police officer training. I don't know, right? We don't really know. Um, and our survey data, when we ask people, and we do believe they tell us the truth, um, that, that may be going up a little bit. Um, so there's some signs, but I would say we don't know. So the question's about confidentiality and it not being guaranteed. I'd have to reread the consent form. What I, what I will say is that, so we do need people's names and contact information to schedule them and remind them about the visit. But after they're here, they get an ID and we strip identifiers from their data. Okay. Um, so after they're paid and they're done, we're, we're done with that information. The other thing that we did is we got what's called a certificate of confidentiality from the government. The National Institutes of Health issues that. And um, I forget what all it says, but I think basically we're not 
if, if someone was involved in a fatal crash or something and lawyers found out that person was a participant in our study, maybe for the defense, we're not obligated to release that information to anyone and theoretically the university lawyers would support us in that. Yeah, for this study we're asking participants to only use flour um, between concentrations, I forget exactly, but it's about 18 to 25 or 30 percent, which is what is in the marketplace, my understanding of what's commonly sold. So it's supposed to reflect what they're, what you would get at a dispensary. So yeah, edibles is just, in concentrates, that's, that's next time. We have a grant under review where we're, we'd love to add concentrates. Questions about the standard field sobriety test, the roadside test. It's uh, three things, walk and turn, which is eight steps, turn around, eight steps, one leg stand, yeah. and uh, uh, eye nystagmus, right? Is there like a eye thing component? Yeah. And two of those things are very balanced related. Alcohol mm -hmm. yeah. really impacts your balance. So it's great that for that, right? <laughs> yeah, it turns out it doesn't seem like people who have used cannabis are affected that way. Um, the eye nystagmus, um, it actually has been used to say if you don't have it, that is, that is consistent with cannabis use, the eye nystagmus. But people are saying now on very high concentrations, some police officers are saying they do see eye nystagmus, which is not what anyone had thought. So it's like this whole new world of higher concentrations, maybe the body reacts differently. So basically, yeah, the roadside test is not validated for cannabis. Simulator research, what we see a lot is people who have used cannabis slow down, act more cautiously, and this is kind of stereotype, stay too, stay too long at the red light. So the profile of driving is more like, a little bit more like someone on their cell phone. They're not keeping up with traffic, they're not, right? And, but with cannabis, there's this, the, the sense is people are like trying to pull it together, trying to compensate, trying to be safer. That's opposite of alcohol, where people are aggressive and speed and tailgate. And yet police officers that I've talked to have said they see a lot of speeding in cannabis use, and it's not with, yeah. And it's because, and they, what they say is they think it's, people are kind of losing track of time or, space or whatever, right? They're kind of, that, that sensation is a little bit dulled, and so people are speeding, not aware that they're speeding. Not doing it on purpose, you know, but. Um, so there's interesting that, that's why I think it's really important to get out of the experimental zone and see what's happening in the real world, because what if people act a certain way in an experiment, and that's not how they're behaving on the roadway. One of the biggest challenges cannabis as medicine is that there, there, is, no one, there is no one cannabis. So people doing these studies um, everyone's using a different kind of formulation, if you will. Like this sounds like a pharmacist's nightmare because it's all the different cannabinoids, different mm -hmm. percent. CBD apparently is a bit of an antagonist to THC, which means right. it brings it down, mm -hmm. right? So like if you're on a high CBD, high THC, the, some of the apparent, it could, yeah. So, I mean, I don't even understand all this. Yeah. So the problem is I think we can't study one thing. We can't study cocaine or whatever, you know? meth, we're studying uh, hundred, hundreds of things. Sure. So, and that's, people ask us, we get the question all the time, well, what, are people allowed to bring in sativa? Are they allowed to, we're, you should limit it, you should limit it this way or that way. Okay, that's great, but like, w there's unlimited ways that we could limit it. And, and some people have suggested you should have people go all buy the same product, right? That's oh. great, and maybe, I, I don't know, but if we do every study like that, that's very challenging to understand every single strain. I think if we find that daily users are not impaired, a challenge to us would be, well, did they actually use enough? If they typically use concentrates and they were in here smoking some flour for 15 minutes, that wasn't enough to get them impaired and they might use in a way that they would be impaired. So I think that's a big um, question. Edibles are a huge question. And there's all this tech that's being developed and I think we have a real, we could provide a service in testing all the tech that's being developed. How do we find participants? Yeah, we're not doing any kind of random sampling. We have done Facebook ads and then the best source of participants has been when we've asked the news, we've pitched our study to the news media and they've come out. Nine News and Channel 7 have come out. There's little clips. And we did um, a story with CPR and then um, some online publications. We want a balance of our age, older and younger age categories, and male and female. That's all we're doing. So yeah, with, with any time you have experiments um, or things that look like experiments, you're generally compromising on generalizability, but um, putting your eggs more in the validity basket. And then like survey research where I spend a lot of time, you tend to want a nice representative sample, but you have less that you can 
learn from people. Are pregnant women allowed to be in the study? They're, they're not. We do a pregnancy test for women. They're excluded. Um, and what's the moral obligation? So actually, it's very hard to convince the IRB that they should be in so because they're, they're a protected population. So they're not, they're not, in this instance, they're not concerned with them being represented. It'd be a problem to not have women, um, but uh, it would be a real challenge to convince them we should have pregnant women. The, um, there is some literature that uh, cannabis is, there's biological reasons to think it'd be harmful for a developing fetus, and there's some limited evidence for some um, health outcomes, but that literature is pretty sparse, but there's certainly not enough to say that it would be safe, and so the IRB would prefer that we not enroll them. Practical application is roadside. Yeah. Potentially also occupational settings. Okay. Yeah. The real limitation, though, with these oh, is they all awesome. require a baseline to see how you're doing sober, and at a roadside, you don't get that. You get the person when they show right, up. Right. So they have to get the point, these, these developers have to get to the point where they have enough normative data to say with a lot of confidence, I don't know how you did before, maybe you were unsafe before, but you're definitely not safe now. Right. And that's, I don't know how many years away we are from that. Currently, what do the DREs use? Um, after they, they determine that they think you're impaired from any drug, they'll invite you to come somewhere to get a blood draw. You can't do a blood draw at roadside in the state. Police officers are not phlebotomists. So they'll take you to a place with a nurse. And then their full assessment, I think it's an hour and a half, they do blood pressure, heart rate, those things are markers for drug use, including, including cannabis. Um, and they questions, um, but they, I don't think they have any devices right now like iPads. I just thought of another application though, and that's personal use. There are people on the market, there's apps on the market that um, you do on your own time, and then you can do before you're like making a decision to drive or not. Um, so so that's something like maybe this could be marketed that way, like get this iPad app, and then you set up your baseline, and then the app yeah. tells you you're messed up for you, according to you. What's the flow? So we actually have people come before their data collection visit just to go over the consent materials and get them comfortable with the space and confirm some things they told us in a survey that they took online before they came, a screening survey. Um, and then they come back a second day and um, do the data collection. So that's doing all the assessments before while they're sober, so they have to have not used. Um, so that's the, the goggles, the iPad, the driving simulator, and a blood draw. And then they're invited to smoke for 15 minutes and then do them all again. And the entire visit's about three hours, just over three hours. And that's why we have snacks and, um, and drinks. And the simulator does make some people feel a, like a little bit motion sick, the opposite of motion sick, um, but it's the same feeling. And so we have some snacks on hand to help with that too. And then someone has to drive them home. A friend or family member has to take them home.